You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. What a beautiful day for horses in the morning. You are listening to the number one horse podcast in the world. Here's your entertaining look at the horse world and the people in it. Well, good morning, everybody. I am Glenn Geek in Ocala, Florida. And I'm Jamie Jennings in Norman, Oklahoma. You're listening to Horses in the Morning on the Horse Radio Network for Wednesday, November 8th, episode 3302. Brought to you today by Kem and Equine. Good morning, horse people. Ah, Wednesday, the day we cover Glenn's favorite topic, <laughs> horse health. And Jamie makes you feel better about yourself with the latest weird news from around the world. Happy Wednesday. Well, happy Wednesday, everybody. We're glad you're joining us today. We're, today, we have Alex on, who's going to tell us about a new website, part of the Equine Network family, actually. It's called MyNewHorse.com, and it's really meant for new horse people. It's it's a place you can send your friends or people who are not horse people that want to get into horses. Send them here first, and then you don't have to answer all their questions. <laughs> <laughs> and we also have Brad from Double D Trailers, who's going to talk about safety concerns while trailering. Uh, it's a new series that we're doing, and Double D agreed to do it. I've been trying to do this for years, uh, because trailer safety is something that we all have to worry about, and he's going to come on on a regular basis and kind of give us the pointer on how to be safe when trailering. Uh, plus, there's a surprise for Jamie. And I did not approve any surprises. <laughs> and some weird news. The nice part about being the boss is she doesn't have to approve the surprises. I do, you, you know how anxiety-inducing a surprise is to me? Like, I, I can't even talk. I'm, I, I'm, I know, I know, I know. And that's why I do it. And then, in the Auditor Post show, we're going to... We, this was an auditor suggestion. We're going to do something called Random Wednesday. Hang around for that. But before we go on, we had some very sad news. Uh, you know, oh my God, uh, this is just—I couldn't believe it when I read it. As a matter of fact, I looked it up in several places to make sure it wasn't, you know, wasn't false. I news. did too. Oh. I did too. So Monday we talked about Cody Dorman, who was the the teenager that the horse Cody's Wish name was inspired by, and Cody, of course, has a rare genetic disorder that can cause delayed growth and intellectual disability, and he was in a wheelchair, and he was at the Breeders' Cup when Cody's Wish won the Breeders' Cup race, and he was in the winning circle and got to see all of that happen, and, and Cody's Wish, of course, the horse is retiring and this was the the last race for the horse and unfortunately when they were taking cody home to kentucky um when they were taking cody dorman home to kentucky the teenager he passed away had a medical event and passed away traveling home um so there's just it's it's so much heartbreak around this story uh, but also like like you know he Cody Dorman was there for Cody's wishes races like all of them. He went to all of them. And to to know that Cody's wish was retiring, it was like he 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 was Cody's wish was done with his races and Cody Dorman was able to let go. I, I don't know. There's something really poetic and beautiful and just utterly heartbreaking, tragically sad. And I read the article and I just started crying. I don't even know, know. this kid. Like, Oh my God. They just, they, they just took the hearts of everybody, just of everybody. And I've read this on the Pollock report, the blood horse, the, it, it touched everybody. People are drawing like there's like cartoons about it with like him sitting on Cody's wish and on his back with the wheelchair on the ground. Oh, Come on now, I can't. I can't do that. Can't see that stuff. Oh, it's just well, heartbreaking. It's one of the and first heart, heart, one of the few heartwarming stories we've had of racing in the last five years, right? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, just know, the way that just, horse responded to yeah. that child is just unbelievable. Now, his father said that he had had more than forty operations in his lifetime, and. They, this was the quote from the dad. With Cody's diagnosis at birth, we always knew the day would come, but we were determined to help Cody live his best life for however long we had him. And boy, they did that. Mm-hmm. You know, they certainly mm-hmm. did that. And for the last day of his life, for him to be, you know, right there in the winner's circle with his horse was just amazing. I mean, Ooh. 
Uh, so that's a tough one. Um, yeah, but we ha- we have a show to do. We have to get on. But our best to the families and everybody involved in racing. And Cody All brought us a beautiful story. And he really did. And he he led what what it turned out to be an incredible life. So mm-hmm. our best to the family. And there's a there's a lot. Yeah, Let's there's see a if lot. you can get through these names. <laughs> oh, oh, so we have a bunch of auditor birthdays today: Jamie Monroe, Katie Moulton, Lynn Perani, Lindsay Reynolds, and Carly Erler. Happy birthday to all of you! And well you know, done. we must have done a really good show on Monday because two people signed up to be auditors after Monday's show. Hannah and Liv, we're glad to welcome you as an auditor. Thank you so much for joining the party. We really appreciate it. Woo! And now I have to give a very, very, very special Daily Winnie to somebody who puts a lot of time and effort into this every year. Her name is Jessica Troop. She was on last Friday's show. You were out then, but we we highlighted some auditors that did cool, cool artistic things. And Jessica <clears throat> showed up. Jessica, every year, for what the last four years maybe, has done Christmas cards for us. And she... Draws them herself, and she always includes Nigel, my wife Jennifer's horse, Scooter, of course, and one of Jamie's horses. And which one did you pick this year? Um, I chose Miles, my Andalusian. Your gray Andalusian, right? Yes. Well, Jamie has not seen the final drawing that's going to be the Just Christmas for those card. listening who don't know the story of Miles, he is the one that a drunk bought in an online auction. So don't think I'm all this hoity-toity, uh, oh, yeah, I have an Andalusian in Puerto Rico. That's not me. No, I was drinking, and I bought a horse on an online auction, and uh, it but he's turned out to out. be one of your It worked out. Heart I, I thought he was a two <laughs> two year old and he was a yearling stud colt. Whatever, it's fine. I mean, everything's fine. <laughs> well, you are gonna die. Jamie has not seen this yet, and we always do this live on the air. I'm gonna put it right now into the production notes so you can see it. Okay. I'm ready. Mm, it I'm should ready. pop in. <clears throat> right underneath Oh the d- my god, that's so <laughs> cute. Isn't it cute? <laughs> Look, it's Miles Chad. <laughs> So so I'll describe it to you, and then we'll post it later everywhere so you can see it. But Scooter's in the middle, uh, my little hackney pony, and he's completely covered in Christmas lights like he got into them, and they got all wrapped around him. Nigel's on one side staring at him like, what the hell again? And <laughs> and then Miles is on the other side with his Christmas hat, by the way. She nailed Miles here in this. It's pretty good, yeah. <laughs> and- I love it. Nigel's wearing a wreath. And Scooter's wearing Christmas lights, and and uh, uh, Miles is wearing a hat, <laughs> Santa hat. <laughs> Miles is looking at Scooter like, I don't know this. Uh, what's going on? <laughs> Just the, so- oh, I really love. I'm going to show Miles this and be like, this is what you could look like if he would lose a hundred pounds. <laughs> this is a thinner version of Miles here. This is like this is like a well. This is a photoshopped version of Miles's waistline. <laughs> so that's our Christmas card. Do you like it? I love it. That's so great. It's so fantastic. And Jessica's so good because all we give her is pictures of the horses. We give her no direction. <laughs> she just makes this stuff up herself. Uh, and, it's uh, absolutely- and it's like snowing and it's a full moon and they're standing in the snow. Oh, I, ha- it's beautiful. I have more good news for you. Every year we put this on T-shirts and mugs and you can get you can get Christmas cards with it. And there's a store. It's a cafe press store. She's putting that. Jessica's putting that together today. And every year we donate the profits to a charity. And she chose Horse and Hound. Your Horse and Hound. So Horse and Hound's going to get all the profits from the charity as well. So Oh, that's so wonderful. Jessica, thank you so much. So. We have amazing listeners, and Jessica, you know this took her hours, right? I mean, it's it's very well done. So. Oh, and she's donating these to Horse and Hound. Oh, my God. Yep. So. Oh, I'm going to cry well, again. Well, she got a horse from Horse and Hound. So, uh, I know. She got, what was the – I can't remember the names of the horse right now. His name was Secret Deployment. His, his name, she calls him Ivan. Ivan, that's right. Oh, I love it. Uh, isn't that a good story? All right, you have a Daily uh, Winnie, too. I just forgot. I'm going to cry again. <laughs> Now I'm going to cry again for my Danny Winnie. 
Because it's it's such a wonderful thing that's happening and such a heartbreaking thing that's happening at the same time, but more leaning on the wonderful, but I'm definitely going to cry like when it happens. Um, our auditor, Celeste Coulter, you know, Celeste, yeah. she has a farm in Virginia and she has adopted um, a stunning black mare called Some Kind of Nights from Horse and Hound. So that is fantastic. The hauler is coming next week to pick Yay. up Some Kind of Nights. She's also taking Effie. No, really? Yeah. I mean, it's. It's it's crazy because they're both black mares this with whole white day is blazes. Me cry now. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm like I'm I like I go I I see I see her every day and I'm like you're gonna be you're gonna be okay. I'm gonna miss, but she I'm gonna miss you. She's farm. the sweetest uh. filly in the world. But she's going to Celeste first of all, someone that we all know, and she's going to. I, I just, I can trust Celeste, you know, I, I can trust her and I know she's a great horse person and she has her own farm and Effie's going to be taken care of. For those who don't know, Effie is my yearling filly that was born here and broke her knee about at about about six weeks, I think she was six weeks old. So she's got a screw in her knee and she's never going to be sound for riding, but her, she's unbelievably bred and so she is going to go to celeste and celeste is going to raise her and maybe have a baby or two or whatever i don't know what she's going to do um but i'm really excited for her and i'm a part of me can't help but be a little sad too because i'm gonna have to put her on the trailer and it's gonna hmm, hmm. you you we have to uh, uh, apply to the guinness world book of records because you have to have the record as the podcast host who has adopted out the most horses <laughs> <laughs> our listeners. It's true. It's true. We just talked about Jessica, who did the Christmas card has one. And there are people all over the country that oh, Horse and Hound has been at. Well, I bought a, we bought a map. Glenn, it's in the tack oh. room at Horse and Hound. And oh, we put push pins, pins yeah. where all the horses are. And it's crazy. It is crazy. Take a picture that of that. I want to see it next time you're over there. Take a picture Next time I'm up there, I'll, I will. Or I'll I have Nelda send me a picture because it is just crazy to think. We've sent them to California, Rhode Island, Florida. I mean, these are Oklahoma thoroughbreds that have been able to go. I've got one in Idaho, Indiana, Michigan, it is just insane. And and now going to Virginia. So well, just another state C to add. Celeste is someone we know we can trust to do the right thing. So Yep. yep. I, I I'm I, I'm so blessed that this has worked out the way that it has. And I'm I, I am sad, but like I'm so thrilled at the same time that it is a great home and she's gonna have a buddy riding up with her and she's gonna she knows this mare, you know, and it's just it's gonna be gonna be good. Well that's good because I wouldn't trust the Effie, the accident prone horse to make the trip by yourself and not jump out of the trailer so. she's going with bob hubbard <laughs> horse transport which is like a ridiculously awesome shipping company so <laughs> i'm not worried about it okay. I'm just, okay. i can't all right you have seven days to get your entries in for radiothon go to horseradionetwork.com click on the holiday radiothon banner we started getting some songs in and somebody uh i won't mention who somebody that was with us in california at monty's place who you know very well submitted a song was and it monty no it was not monty <laughs> although that would be great if you could get him to do that That'd be uh -huh. yeah, yeah sure yeah. you're day. gonna be with him in new york just have him sing for you um, so yeah, so we're starting to get the entries in now. They all come in at the last minute. We need a bunch more. We need like 16 more. So you have seven days to get your entries in, go to horse radio network, click on the holiday radiothon banner, gives you all the directions there, what to do. We now have prizes keep coming in. We now have over $4,000 in prizes. Oh, wow. So now uh, can people send in voicemails yes. and just like messages well, or does well, it have to be a poem and song? The voicemails would be about your best holiday Christmas fail. And we've started getting bo Carly, whose birthday we had. She sent one in about her holiday Christmas fail. So, yes, you can just call a voicemail. Plus, you can just register to win. This year, you don't have to submit anything. There's a registration right on the website there that I gave you. You can just sign up and you'll, you'll get an entry to, to win the prizes that day. So you can just register to win as well. I have uh, to think about my best holiday Christmas fail. I, know, I have to think about that too. I, I, I did, one did not come jumping out at me, so I have to really think about it. 
Uh, State Line TAC is going to be at Equine Affair. And I know a lot of our listeners are going to be, too. The auditors have been talking about Equine Affair for the last two weeks. So if you're going to be at Equine Affair, please stop by State Line TAC's booth. They're going to have a ton of stuff there. I know they always have stuff on sale for the holidays, for Christmas shopping. So if you're going to be doing your Christmas shopping, head on over to State Line TAC and do that at Equine Affair. And, of course, you can always visit them at StateLineTAC.com. And they are the title sponsor for Radiothon this year, so thank you to them for that as well. Coming up, our first guest today is Alex, and she is uh, with a sister company here uh, at Equine Network, and they started a new website to help new people out that get into the horse world, because it is very confusing. We're indoctrinating by the thousands. <laughs> we help them on our end, and then they actually help them with the, the real information over at MyNewHorse.com, and we're going to get Alex on to tell us all about it. Alex, welcome to the show. Hello, thanks for having me. So, Alex, what part of the country are you in? I am in Cincinnati, Ohio. Oh, wow, okay. we st- not too far from Lexington. Jamie and I both lived. Uh, yeah, I spent about uh, 13 years in Lexington before heading north. We all lived in Lexington and then moved. What's that say? I, <laughs> I know. What's up with that? Know, it's horse but, country. We shouldn't yeah, be well, moving. <laughs> why did you go to Cincinnati of all places? That's what I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll blame my husband for that. <laughs> okay, there you go. There you go. He's not there. Yeah. You can blame him. It's fine. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, and we've all flown out of Cincinnati. Those of us that have lived in Lexington. So, um, yeah. So, so yeah, do you right have a horse currently? I do. I have one horse. Um, his name is Zion. He's an off-track thoroughbred that I've had for almost four years now. We oh, did wow. the thoroughbred makeover. Oh, great. Yes. And what are you doing with yeah. Zion now? Um, we are doing the hunters. Uh, we play around in the adult hunter ring. Um, we just have some fun. We're, we don't take ourselves too seriously anymore. Well, good. I think that's more fun that way anyway. It is. <laughs> uh, Jamie and I have never taken ourselves seriously. So, <laughs> What year did you do the makeover? We did it in 2021. Oh, cool. That's awesome. I was 2019. I was seeing if we were like stable next to each other, you know. <laughs> Actually, we might have been. I did it in 2019 on another horse as well. Oh, wow. So. Oh, okay. You cool. There you go. <laughs> it's a cool experience. <laughs> so, Alex, what inspired My New Horse, the website? Well, um, we've kind of been tossing around the idea of this uh, website, this resource for new horse owners um, for quite some time. Um, but we realized that here at Equine Network, um, that we have all these brands and websites that are reaching so many horse people and people in the horse industry, um, except for one population of people. And those are the new horse owners, the people that are just getting into horseback riding or ownership. And they're kind of the ones that probably need our help the most. Um, so we just kind of wanted to create a, a resource that they could go to um, that was super approachable, has information that's very easy to understand, um, uh, where they could go and get all their questions answered. So we, I, I think this is brilliant. For years, we've been saying it's very confusing when you get a horse to know. I mean, you can go to the horse.com to learn health stuff, but most of it's over our heads and we've been in horses for 30 years. Um, right. You know, and it's just so complicated. And, and everybody in the horse world has an opinion about how to do it and none of them <laughs> agree. So, so, right. <laughs> so you tend to, you know, you tend to learn from a friend or somebody at the barn or somebody like that, but there, there's not been a good resource to go say, Hey, I want to buy a horse. I want to know what to do after I buy a horse. I want to find a boarding stable. I want to know how to take care of my horse, all of that stuff. And is that what my new horse does? That is exactly what my new horse does. Uh, we want to be able to address anyone's questions for, on topics ranging from, yeah, where to find a horse and how to buy a horse and what it's going to cost you to then once you get your horse, how to care for it, where to keep it, what to feed it, uh, how to groom it, uh, how to handle it safely. Um, and we just we think there's no such thing as a, a dumb question when you're getting into horse ownership because there are so many aspects involved. and. Um, and you're also dealing with 1,200-pound animals, so we want people to do it 
do it right and not get hurt and take good care of their horse in the process. I, I love how it's laid out because you it, the one, the website's very simple and it's laid out in, in sort of like categories that guides you through the different steps, the steps that you described of getting a horse. So you can find a number of articles on uh, how, how to buy a horse, how to, how to plan your first barn. Uh, which is mm-hmm. something that you know most of us have to do that have horses over uh, our lifetime. We end up bringing them home at some point, a lot of us. And you have to figure out, okay, now how am I going to make this that thing that used to be a garage into a barn, or I'm going to build one, or I'm you know I'm just going to make do with what I have. Our first barn was a bank barn that had cows in it, so we had to jackhammer the concrete out because you couldn't stand up in the bottom of it where the stalls were going to go. Well, first of all, the the poop went up to about the ceiling. And then once we got that out, we had to jackhammer the concrete out. I mean, it was a nightmare, but we all go through that as new horse owners. Right. And um, yes, especially for people that are trying to do it themselves on their own properties for the first time. I mean, that can be incredibly intimidating. And where do you even start? So um, well, but, yeah, we want to we want to approach every every angle. Everything from fencing to, you know, what type of fencing, what will work, what won't work. We, we've we been up at our uh, property. We have a new property that we're getting ready to put a house and a barn on, and we've been bringing the horses up there and kind of camping on its five acres, and we put up electric fence. Well, the other day, I looked over. My pony scooter was pushing on the electric fence, eating on the other side of it, which made me determined it wasn't really hot. Uh, <laughs> it's so uh, the really deep assessment there, Glenn. <laughs> Way to right. reach. Put that together. Quick. I thought it was hot, but apparently it wasn't hot. But I mean, it's just everything is confusing when you first start with horses. Right. And there, yeah, there, there's just, there are, there's so many things that go into caring for an animal like that and so many ways it can go wrong. So uh, yes, we're here to help. So, so th- I was joking earlier in the show, but I think this is really true. When you have somebody that you know that says, I want to get into horses, give them this website first. Go, go, go into it with this knowledge base before you get your horse. Or maybe if you're, you're taking riding lessons and you're thinking about getting a horse. Um, yeah, explore our resources. Um, know, go, go through our budgeting section. Know what things you're going to have to be prepared to pay for. Um, yeah, the, 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 best, the best way to approach horse ownership is definitely to be prepared. You know what, though? If they go through the budgeting session, a section, <laughs> I think that's going to discourage a lot of people. So maybe, <laughs> maybe they should just learn that after they buy the horse. What do you think, Jamie? We're gonna... I mean, what could possibly go wrong? Come on. <laughs> I love this. What's the, is it just mynewhorse.com? It's mynewhorse.com, yep. And they can get there. Well, I thank you for putting the time. I know this has been a project that's been in the works for quite a while. Thank you for putting the time into it. I know you're going to be adding articles all the time. Uh, So head on over there right now to mynewhorse.com. Check it out. And if you have anybody in your world that's looking at getting started in horses, send them there. And then you'll you'll avoid having to answer 5,000 questions when they can get them answered there. It'll save save you (laughs) some time sending them there. Thanks, Alex. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. All right. Take care. Thanks. So that's mynewhorse.com. Check that out today. I think it's a brilliant idea, actually. (laughs) What could possibly go wrong with just get a horse? You don't need to learn anything. It'd be fine. That's how most people do it. So I remember, you know, even we've seen all these comments, too, in the audit room over the years. Just shop. Even when you're experienced, things like shopping for boarding stables and stuff. It's a nightmare. I mean, it's hard because you don't know what's right and you tend to not know what to believe. And it's just it's just tough. All those things apply to horse owners as well. Knowledgeable horse owners. Yes. It's so, so true. Yeah, yes, all of it. All true. All right. We're going to hear from Daily Dose Equine right now. And then we're going to go into our first segment. I did. I had a chance to chat with, and I really liked him, and I, I, I asked him to do this for us. His name is Brad from Double D Trailers. Brad kind of is the owner-operator of Double D. Double D is known for making really fine quality trailers in the Carolinas. And I told him, look, we get so many questions about trailers and trailer safety and driving and backing up and just all that stuff. And 
mind, what, you know, what can we do to help people understand? He said, well, let's just do some segments. So today's segment is the first of five that we're going to do. We're going to do one a month over the next five months talking about trailer safety and the things you need to look out for. Uh, and today's, I think, is going to be very helpful for everybody that owns a trailer. I'm here with the mad scientist who developed Daily Dose Equine Horse Feeds, Janet Geyer. And I wanted to have a quick chat with you because Daily Dose Equine Horse Feed are non-GMO whole food nutrition based. And a lot of people go, oh, that comes from a small dedicated feed mill. I won't be able to get that when I travel. They're wrong, aren't they? They are. You can get it through Chewy anywhere in the United States. Or if you live locally in Maryland and Northern Virginia, you can get it delivered. There you go. Chewy.com. It will deliver it anywhere you want. You can also schedule delivery in advance so you can have it delivered every X number of days. And you can go in there to your account and change it every time you move horse show venues. So check it out today. DailyDoseEquine.com online or Chewy.com. Welcome to our monthly horse trailer series brought to you by Double D Trailers. Find them online at DoubleDTrailers.com. That's double, the letter D, Trailers.com. Well, Glenn here, founder of the Horse Radio Network and host of Horses in the Morning. One of the top requested segments we have gotten from listeners is about trailers and trailer safety. Brad Heath from Double D Trailers has agreed to help us with a five-part series on trailers that we're going to do one a month over the next five months. Brad is the owner of Double D Trailers with over 25 years of experience in horse trailer manufacturing and the equestrian industry. He also has his own podcast. We'll talk about that later. Today in part one, we're talking about the do's and don'ts of trailer hauling. And I think, Brad, when it, when somebody gets a brand new trailer and they never hauled a trailer before, it's terrifying, right? You probably see it with new owners all the time. We do. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me on the show, Glenn. But our drivers will often roll up to a uh, new owner, new buyer, never towed a trailer before. And I always tell them, I say, hey, just, you know, slip my driver 20 bucks and say, will you get in and ride with me and kind of give me some pointers. So that happens uh, fairly frequent. Yeah. And, you know, I think everybody, there was just a post on on our auditor page about backing up. Everybody has, a, you know, you, you have to practice for a long time to feel like you've nailed the backing up part of a trailer. That's right. Yeah, you, you really do. You know, I, we grew up on a farm and burning tobacco and things like that. So, it, you know, second nature for us. But if you've never done it, it does take a bit of practice. Well, let's talk about what's the number one mistake horse owners make when it comes to towing the trailer. Mm, I see a lot of unlevel trailers going up and down the road and particularly in gooseneck, um, you know, as we've manufactured over the years, the height of tow vehicles have continued to get taller and taller. You know, if you look at a 1995 Ford Chevy Dodge, whatever it is, and look at the height from the ground to the top of the tailgate, it, you know, it might be 55 inches or whatever the number is. And during those uh, years, we built the trailer for the vehicles uh, during that period. But now with the vehicles being so much taller and folks having older trailers, they'll purchase a used trailer that's not really designed for these higher built vehicles. And so what you and I'm sure you've seen them, too. They're going down the road and, yep, and you think uh, the, the horses goose, are going to fall out the back. Yeah, yeah the, the gooseneck is all jacked up. And, you know, we see it on bumper pulls, too. Uh, I've seen the front end nosedived on the bumper pull or the front end is, you know, is jacked up. So, um, yeah, the trailer should be towed level. How do you uh, fix that with a gooseneck? I feel like it's easy. It's, you know, you can get, you can get balls that you lo are lower and things with the tagalongs. And, and I feel like it's easier to fix that with them with a the goosenecks. That's, that's right. Uh, bumper pull is an easy adjustment for any vehicle with a gooseneck. You know, if you've got a trailer that I built in 2001 and you're currently towing today with a, 2024 new whatever vehicle that's really high off the ground that 2001 trailer there is no adjustment to try to get it level with that tow vehicle because the problem is is when you let the front end of the trailer down so that it's level 
you're going to smack the tailgate, you know, there's just not enough height there. And so you have two options uh, or three rather, but one extend the coupler, which raises the front end of the trailer, which we don't want that throws more pressure on the back axle It's going to cause a a lot of issues uh, long-term. Your other option would be to block the trailer axles. So you lift the entire trailer Mm -hmm. higher And by doing so, you can gain more clearance and then try to level it out. Uh, The downside to that is you can lift the trailer and with the block in between the the frame and the axles, but the fenders themselves, you can't, you typically can't lower those back down. They're often welded on or bolted on. So you end up seeing trailers if they've been lifted going down the road and there's this huge gap between the top of the tire and the bottom of the fender. And then your last option Buy a new trailer. Buy a new trailer. <laughs> it's built, you know, with the or an old truck. Or an old truck, you know, something that's lower, either a lower truck or a higher trailer. I mean, that's it. How about yeah. uh, you know? I, next question is: What are some warning signs uh, that a trailer is being towed incorrectly? And I think we all know the one, and that is you're driving down the highway, especially with tagalongs. You're going to see this, and it just gets squirrely on. It feels like you have a snake behind you. Uh, the trailers feels like it's all over the road. That's definitely a concern. We tend to build our trailers, um, not insult, but idiot proof, so to speak, meaning that if you have a two horse bumper pull or a three horse bumper pull and you haul one horse in the very back end of the trailer, you're not going to get that negative tongue weight. So we position the axles under the assumption that at some point, either a horse is going to get loose by himself in there or somebody's going to haul him in the wrong stall. And so, you know, we just avoid that altogether. Uh, on the on the warning signs, um, we see the tires just wearing uneven, and it will overheat the bearings on the back axle. If you're driving with the front end lifted up, you'll have that uneven tire wear. You can bend an axle, um, so you can really cause a lot of problems in doing so. And lastly, uh, if it's a bumper pull and the thing is nose dived, in other words, the front end is too low. It just pulls rough. You can feel all the bumps. Everything hits kind of hard. Vehicles just, you know, it, it's it's not comfy. Well, you brought up tires, Brad, and this is the th- mistake I see people make. I think that the RV community is actually more aware of this than the the horse trailer community, and that is your tires, right? We think, well, I don't drive the trailer very much. I drive it maybe, you know, 20 times in a year, so I'm not putting much wear on the tire. What they forget, especially in climates like Florida, is the dry rot, that you still got five years in that tire, and you're probably going to have to replace it no matter how much you've driven on it. That that is absolutely correct. I had a client in California just uh, a couple months ago, you know, the trailer is built um, middle of the U.S. We have to haul it all the way across the country. And she was worried about a, a couple thousand miles on the tires. And I said, what what you may not realize is that tires age out. They don't wear out. Average person, how many miles a year are you going to put, you know, put on a trailer? Ten thousand, if that And so you'll never wear the tread out. Uh, Each tire has a date code, which is the date that the tire was manufactured. And most of the companies that we work with, they recommend changing tires every four to five years. So as long as you keep the tires aired to the correct pressure, we see a lot of overinflated tires, a lot of underinflated tires. And while we're on the subject, if you run a trailer, with an underinflated tire, you know, it's going to cause excess heat and do some things to, you know, the chemical makeup of the rubber that it shouldn't do. And then you arrive to point B and you put air in it and you're like, okay, well, that that's fine. Well, mm, not really, because you've, you've already damaged the sidewall of that tire. And that's where we see those blowouts occur long term. So keep the tires aired properly. Check them each and every time. Change them out every five years and life will be much better. Very good. What's the, uh, there's a common belief that any vehicle can tow a horse trailer as long as the numbers match on paper. So, I, you know, I look at the numbers from my truck. I look at the numbers from my trailer. Uh, and I think this is a big one, and, and we constantly see this one, right? And this is partly where we see the trucks going down the road looking like a V, uh, where the trailer's dragging the ground and the truck. You know, part of that is you have too much trailer for the truck. 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's, there's just, there's just not enough there. Uh, the, the, you know, what we face is an uphill battle often as trailer designers, clients will contact us and it's not their fault. Vehicle manufacturers, as well as sales folks at vehicle dealerships, they all want to brag about how much their vehicle can pull. Oh, it'll tow it, that type thing. And Chevy or whatever the manufacturer is may advertise the tow vehicle will pull 13,000 pounds. Client says, well, how much does your trailer weigh? Uh, this one's about 5,500 with two horses. You're about 8,000. So they think, oh, well, I can tow 13,000. I'm only hauling eight. Life is good. And, you know, unfortunately, that's true, but not true because a load is only as strong as the weakest link in the equation. You can have a really, really, really strong trailer, a really, really, really powerful truck. But if the coupler hook into things together is, you know, subpar and it breaks, that's the, the weak link. And same thing in towing. Uh, the number that the manufacturers never really focus on, nor the salesperson at the dealership is not going to tell you this, is this little thing called payload and tongue weight. And that's really the, the weak link, the limiting factor for all tow vehicles uh, in, in towing. And I often try, I often use the analogy with clients. I said, just imagine you're, you're in your bedroom, you're getting ready to kind of rearrange things. The dresser is there and it's pretty heavy, but you, you might be able to slide it around by yourself. So you could push it or you could pull it. What you probably can't do is pick one end of the dresser up and drag it. And that's essentially what your tow vehicle is doing. It could push or pull the trailer, but when you ask it to actually carry a lot of that weight as well as pull, that's where you start to run into problems. So uh, if the tongue weight is greater than what the vehicle manufacturer recommends, it's too much. Uh, it, it really is. And payload, we you know, people forget too. You have when you're taking a look at payload, whether it's an RV or horse trailer, right? When you're taking a look at payload, you have to take everything into consideration. Consideration that's everybody in the vehicle. What's everybody mm -hmm. weigh? All your stuff because you all carry too much stuff to the horse shows. All the stuff in the trailer, and that includes water. Water's heavy, right? All yeah. of that stuff has to be taken into consideration, and then. I, I agree with you. I think the tongue weight or that payload capacity, those numbers are more important than what can I tell? They, they really are. Yeah. I mean, that, that's where it's at is in payload. We, we rarely look at the gross towing capability of the vehicle because if it's rated to carry the tongue weight, it's going to have the rating to pull it as well. And you're right on payload. It's the, the passengers, the driver, whatever's in the cab of the vehicle. If it's a truck, whatever's in the bed of the truck. Uh, plus the tongue weight of the trailer, because that weight is, is also there. So all of those things have to be factored in. And that leads us to the next thing that you have to worry about if you're overweight, right? If you're uh, what we call un under trucked, if you're under trucked, then you got braking to think about. Uh, yeah. They, and everybody thinks, well, my trailer has brakes. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, you know, the thing about uh, brakes, we, uh, we just uh, went to the mountains this past week with the family and my wife is driving and I ask her, I'm a right seat driver. She probably didn't like it, but I asked her, I said, do you remember in uh, driver's ed uh, how they told you to gauge how close to follow another vehicle? And when I came along, it was a three second rule. So as the vehicle passed us a, a sign or a mark on the road, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, and if that vehicle slams on brakes, you have enough time, hopefully, to react to keep from eating the back end of, of them up. Pulling a horse trailer, that's a lot more weight that you have to stop. It really is. So, um, you know, the, the best thing to do, in my opinion, is practice a little bit and figure out sort of what extra stopping distance that you will need uh, to keep from eating up the back end of someone else's vehicle. The trailers do have brakes. The tow vehicles have brakes. If the tow vehicle is rated to haul the amount of weight of the trailer and it's a good braking system on the trailer, uh, you'll certainly be able to stop it without issue. But it's not going to stop nearly as quickly as if you didn't have a trailer back there. So you just need to be aware um, of how much distance is going to take. 
Very good. Where can they find uh, your website and you know, dealers? No dealers. Everything's factory direct. Uh, we've always done that. We Every single person that we've ever sold to, we know who they are, what their name is, where they live. And, you know, we've, we've got that personal connection. If they have a problem with it, we're the ones that they call and you know, we, we take care of it. So, yeah, just jump on our site, doubledetrailers.com. It's all on there. And for uh, your all podcast listeners listening to this, and Brad does one. So give us a quick, quick plug for your podcast. Yeah, check out uh, the Horse Trailer Post podcast. We do one every two weeks, a new episode. And, you know, I've had the privilege of interviewing just a a lot of uh, interesting and smart people all across the world. And uh, it's quite fascinating. Things that I had never heard of or thought about. My daughter is the one that schedules all that, my oldest daughter. And so uh, she does a fantastic job putting all that together. Well, welcome to my world, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. It's double D trailers.com. Time to learn why some days you're embarrassed to be part of the human race in Jamie's Weird News. That's right. Weird things keep happening all over the world, Glenn. No shortage this week, okay? Stories. So basically what happens is uh, if you see a weird a story in the news and you're like, man, that's super weird, email it to me, jamie at horseradionetwork.com with weird news in the subject line. So then you can be a part of the show like Stephanie, Kelly, Christiana, Joe Lynn, Jody, Sarah, Julie, Laureen, Abby, and Rebecca all were this week. And uh, thank you guys for sending in your weird news stories. Um, basically, it, it's just, it's just, it just never stops, Glenn. It just never stops. Uh, well, and, I think it's actually getting worse. So I don't think you're going to run out of material. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it, the, the thing that really never stops is there's one place that just always is in the weird oh, news. Florida's back. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. We're going to start with Florida because it, it's that time of year, Glenn. It's fall. The leaves are changing. They're the coming down. The weather's starting <laughs> to get cold. But there's also something that Floridians have to be made aware of. There's so many of our listeners that are in Florida, and I've got a PSA for you. What happens to Florida, Florida when the weather drops? The temperatures drop. Um, the crazies get it are colder? Things start falling out of the sky. Oh, we're back to that again. <laughs> <laughs> it's iguana falling season, people. That's right. Apparently in Florida, there's an overabundance of invasive species of iguanas. That is true in okay. the south, especially Miami, Palm Beach area. Wellington. I remember there's iguanas in the pool in Key West when we were yeah, there. Like yep. they, they just they jump in. Uh, so yeah, apparently when it gets cold enough, iguanas become immobilized and freeze. Okay, so they're in the tree. I think it's like it when it drops down into the 40s, gets below 50, they freeze. But they're not frozen. They're just they can't move. So they're not dead. So what happens is they're in a tree. And then they freeze and they fall out of trees. So it is the time of year where you need to watch where you're walking because iguanas could fall on your head, which if somebody could get that on video, that would be the greatest thing ever. Imagine (laughs) if an iguana fell like down the back of your shirt and it was like cold. Oh, my God, that'd be awesome. And some of them are huge. We don't have them in Ocala. We're too far north. But down there, they're a foot or two foot long. They're huge. Yeah, they can be huge or they can be tiny, yeah. seem like little snakes. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they freeze and fall. Um, they are saying that it's best to just leave them be because they're not dead. When it heats back up, they re- re- they revive themselves and start to walk around. Now, they're also saying um, you can kill them too. It's They're not protected. You can kill them. But I wouldn't say kill them. Just send them up to Ocala. Glenn needs some more pets in his yard. <laughs> yeah, we need some. Black Panthers aren't enough. We need to add iguanas to it. I mean, come on. Let's do it. All right, next story. All right. I'm going to get it together here on my brain. I have great news, Glenn. It is a news story that affected the entire country, and it happened in Cumberland Township, Pennsylvania, and it even attracted people from Hollywood to get involved to bring Kevin Bacon home. (laughs) 
Do you know who Kevin Bacon yeah, is, Glenn? Kevin Bacon is, yes. Not that Kevin Bacon. Oh, different Kevin, Kevin Bacon. Kevin Bacon is a two-year-old, 200-pound Juliana pig that escaped from his farm. And apparently... Kevin Bacon was seen all over the place, but nobody could get Kevin Bacon to come home. Nobody could catch him because he was like, you know, a wild. Because he's a 200 I mean, pound wild. pig. <laughs> he's a 200 pound pig. And he was like, Meh! and they would pretty just much run do off. what they want. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So they figured out a way to, to get him. Not after uh, Kevin Bacon from Hollywood tweeted, bring Kevin Bacon home and tweeted a picture of him. <laughs> it says an escaped pig named Kevin Bacon is becoming an internet sensation. There was a bring Kevin Bacon home Facebook page started. And then they start, they've now that he is home, uh, they've changed the name of it. So uh, it's, it's just Kevin Bacon adventures, I think now. Um, but yeah, so he would go into the, out in the open and start grazing. And then people would be like, Hey, there's Kevin Bacon. He was like, Meh! and they run back into the woods and you, you can't outrun Kevin Bacon. Uh, so he would just get away. And then she was trying to, the owner uh, was trying to let all the hunters know, please don't shoot my pig. There's a pig in the woods and it's mine. And it's like a little pinto looking pig. <laughs> so do you know how they ended up catching it? Kevin Bacon? I don't know. No. They took a sticky bun, like one of those garbagey <laughs> sticky that would buns. Do it for me. <laughs> and they put set it out, but they stuffed it full of Benadryl. <laughs> so. <laughs> Kevin Bacon. The, so they, well, what they were doing is they were putting sticky buns out for like a week. And then like the fifth one had a ton of Benadryl in it. <laughs> and so here's the thing. You think you, you got this. They have a picture of the uh, Benadryl laced uh, thing. It looks just like you would think it is a Benadryl, pink Benadryl stuffed all in the icing. And you would think that with all of his adventures, uh, it, you'd have to like get a stretcher to go get like, what do you do when he falls asleep? Because they were like walking through the woods looking for him after he ate the sticky bun. Um, do you know where he went when he was getting sleepy? No, no. He went home did into he? his cage. He did. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. I know. It's so funny. She says, today around noon, my husband and I walked outside surveying the woods to look for Kevin. And then when we came back, I saw he had wandered over to the pen on his own. <laughs> that used to be Jennifer and I Saturday morning is those sticky buns. You, you crack open the cardboard and you lay them out and you pour the goopy icing. Oh, so oh they were so you're good. lucky to be alive, Glenn. You're <laughs> lucky to be alive. All right. Next story. <laughs> Now we're going to go to England, <laughs> and, and and I don't know if I can communicate the severity of this story without a picture. So maybe I'll I'll take a picture and I'll text it to you, and I'll tell you when you can. Uh, let me see here. I'm going to message Glenn. Hold on, and then I'm going to take a picture of this, and I'm going to send it to you. Okay, don't look at it yet because I got to tell you the story. So there's a crew in England and they were investigating a block toilet. No big deal, right? They're just the plumbers come out to take care of a block sewage line. And it's a sewer line that goes into a septic tank. So it's kind of a big issue. So there's a bunch of people there and is Wessex water is out there and they're trying to, there's just trying to push through something in the, and there's just a big block in the, toilet line and they just can't get through so now open the picture and it'll show you what it was okay you texted it to me i texted okay. it to you right. what the hell is that could you imagine pull okay oh my god it's a baby doll's head <laughs> it is the head an ancient skull or something it looks like a child's head and all of that hair that's yeah, on it those are actually wet wipes and nasty poo goo <laughs> uh, and so, so could you gross. imagine being like i can't get figured out and you finally hook it and you pull it out of the line you pull up a head <laughs> a head <laughs> How did it get down there? Well, the one of the kids shoved it down 30 years ago, a probably. child <laughs> shoved it down in the whole thing. They said workers investigating a block toilet had a fright when they found the head of a doll complete with gruesome hair made up of flushed wet wipes. 
They're also saying, please don't flush wet wipes also <laughs> because they are plastic and they don't break yeah, down in toilet paper. <laughs> especially into your, your sewer tank. So when we ha- when we first met, all those years ago, Jennifer lived on this farm that they had just gotten, and they had the septic guy out to pump the septic. I don't know how he did this, but apparently the people who lived there before had flushed a ring. I think it was a diamond ring. Had flushed a diamond ring somehow, probably accidentally. The septic guy brought it up to the door. He found it while pumping the tank. How oh does my that gosh. happen? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. We, we, that, uh, I was always wondering know, about that. <laughs> the less I know about septic systems, the better I think I'm going to be. Yeah, you it's have one cool. at the farm there, don't you? Yup, I'm on a septic tank. <laughs> if you recall, when we first moved here, it got punctured. Oh, that's right. Yes. That was fun. All right, final story. And this is um, interesting. And we're going to go, guess where we're going for this one, Glenn? Mm, you wanna, uh, you wanna take, Oklahoma. Take, no. No, definitely not. This only happens in Florida. (laughs) So there's a thrift store and this is in, let me see the small. Okay. uh, Fort Myers. Okay. Way down South. Yep. Way down South uh, on North Cleveland Avenue. There's a, um, a a thrift store and there was a guy uh, browsing the thrift store and he happens to be an anthropologist. But that's unrelated to the story, sort of, because he's an anthropologist and he's browsing a Halloween section of the thrift store. And he's like, I don't think that's a plastic skull. That looks like a real human skull to me. He's an anthropologist. It's in a glass case. He asked to see it. And he's like, oh, God, that's a real skull. (laughs) In a thrift store, in a Halloween decoration. Let's think about this for a second. Whose skull is that? And why is it there? The poor clerk who makes minimum wage then had to call the police. (laughs) They had to call the police, the Lee County Sheriff's (laughs) Office, the medical examiner's office to facilitate further testing of the skull. And uh, this was on NBC News, by the way. This is not like a small, weird news story. This is the authorities did say that the case is, quote, not suspicious in nature. Yes, it is. (laughs) There's a head. A human head. So do you know where the skull came from? Uh, I have this no idea. <laughs> thinks, do you know that show Storage Wars? Yes. Okay. So this skull was, was purchased container? from a storage unit. Oh, no. And they th- the storage unit was purchased years prior. And they finally got around to going through all of it. And I guess that's how they get all their thrift store stuff is they just like buy storage units, go through and sell all the stuff in the thrift store, not knowing that it was a real human skull what else was in that why was it in the storage unit glenn why was it in a box whose head is it yes. who does it belong to why is it be why did somebody save that there's i have more questions than answers people oh, you don't have That's answers all to all, I know. all that i, was waiting I don't for the have answer. any answers <laughs> did, we, did, did they determine how old it was no there's no fault this like, was just it an happened. ancient skull or a more it's... current skull it's 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 a human head. So here, uh, I mean, that's a short article. It's like four paragraphs long. The shopper recognized the skull to be much more than a spooky decoration. When detectives responded to the store, uh, they recovered the skull and believed it to be human. The store owner says the skull was located in a storage unit that was purchased years prior. They will the Lee's County Sheriff's Office will work in conjunction with the medical examiner's office to facilitate further testing All right, of the keep skull. Keep an eye out. I want a result of that one. So keep there's your eye gotta out. be more. Yes, we need the autopsy. Or I, don't I know need if it's an autopsy. more information. Like, <laughs> who procures a skull, a human skull, and like? Well, the I guy could have been a, like a teacher. I think he was a science teacher at high school, and then he died, and he got or, this skull through the through the Skulls R Us website. He's a science teacher that died in a storage unit. Jennifer's cracking, cracking up at Skulls R Us. <laughs> Dot com. <laughs> it could be the teacher. Okay. He might have been in a box in the storage unit. We don't know. There's okay. so many questions. Oh, well, I'm going to I'm going to try and answer one and I'll probably get arrested. Can you buy a human skull? <laughs> Your uh, search engine has just been flagged. Um, real human skulls for sale. You can Get at theboneroom.com. Do you want to um, know how much one costs? 
I just puked in my mouth a little bit, but please tell me. $1,400. What a deal. I don't think I it's would sell. It's perfectly legal to possess and sell human bones in the United States. There are a few exceptions to this and a few states that have banned it, but otherwise it's perfectly legal. What states have banned it? Because I want to live there. Say. Oh, wait a minute. Oh. The bone room cannot ship to any human bones. The fo- Oh, my God. You would think these would be the states you could. These are the states that you can't own a human bone. Georgia, Tennessee, and Louisiana. <laughs> <laughs> That's because the rules are put in because people yes. m- made mistakes. So there's some mistakes that have been made in Georgia, Tennessee, Tennessee. and Louisiana. <laughs> did you know this? I did. Did not I know, know that you could buy human no. skulls? No, I did not know that. Fourteen hundred dollars. Yep. Yep. I wonder uh, what this one was going for at the thrift store. Oh, you can buy specialty say. skulls as training aids. So don't ask. I don't want to know. What's a specialty skull? I don't know. I don't uh. want to know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. Well, that's a happy note to end the show. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We really, today's been a day on the show. We've gone through no. all the emotions today. <laughs> thank you, Florida, for continuing to be a contributor. <laughs> <laughs> At the three mm-hmm. states, I would not have guessed. I would have guessed California. You couldn't own a skull. That's what I would Apparently, have Apparently, you can do whatever you want in California. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> New York City you can be just decorated <laughs> with human skulls. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. We really appreciate it. We'll be back on Friday with another show. Tomorrow is the National Reigning Horse Association episode. And then Friday, we're going to do some really bad ads. So get we need some. So get them into Jennifer at HorseRadioNetwork.com. They always slow down this time of year because people like get busy and crap so uh don't forget too that you have to uh get your entries in go to horseradionetwork.com and click on the radiothon banner and uh tells you exactly how to send your voicemails in to us so that we can play them on radiothon and we're hang on auditors we're going to be here we're going to start random wednesday or we're going to do it this week anyway then i'll forget next week yeah uh, be <laughs> Say, you'll forget <laughs> Don't buy human remains. $1,400. You too can have your own head. You're search engine. You're going to get arrested. The police are on their way. 